Good morning, everybody. How is everybody today? So first of all, nothing to do with what I'm about to speak about. Um, did everyone hear that they got all the boys out of the cave in Thailand? They're all out now. Fantastic. I can now, uh, I have 11-year-old uh, twins, so I've been up till 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning watching that stuff. So good morning. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, so by way of introduction, so I spent, I spent a, about 25 years in corporate America working for very large companies. Um, and I found that very large companies are very, very good at organizing for sustainable growth um, in, a, in a sustainable growth environment. I found they're very good about protecting against risk, against risk, excuse me. But what large companies tend not to be good at is being innovative, okay? Being innovative, disruptive, thinking about change. And also large companies tend not to be great at thinking about what's gonna happen two to three years out. Okay, and that's, and that's the, sort of the main, the main premise of what I'd like to talk about today. So, I run a company called EXO Works. We help very large companies disrupt themselves. So, I'm trying to get as near to your industries as possible here. So, Stanley Black & Decker has a, uh, a very large um, manufacturing business. It's a, it's a $2 billion business. The average, um, so, sorry, these are all our clients, okay. So, the average uh, car on the planet has a seven, seven dollars worth of tiny pieces of plastic on those cars, which was made by Stanley Black & Decker. The business is growing at about 15% every year. They're doing great, but they've hired us to come in and help them to disrupt themselves. Why is that? Because they're worried that people aren't gonna be buying cars anymore. You know, um, driverless cars, Uber, Lyft, they're worried that they, their manufacturing base is gonna, their client base is gonna go away. Another of our clients, um, TD Ameritrade, we work with the CEO of TD Ameritrade. Their business is doing fantastic. They're the biggest uh, uh, financial brokerage company in the US. They're doing great. But the CEO, Tim Hockey, knows that brokerage fees are going away. Once brokerage fees are going away, a, a big piece of their business goes away, so they've hired us to come in and help them to disrupt themselves. We also work with cities. So this is the University of Miami. We actually, we actually um, are in the middle of a project for, uh, excuse me, not the University, the city of Miami. We're in the middle of a project with uh, the mayor of Miami all around um, transportation. So they have a lot of traffic problems. We ran a sprint. We, we recently persuaded them not to build a new railway system, which there's some people in this room potentially not, not very happy at us. But, um, so we've actually helped him to prepare for the future by thinking through the technology. We've done the same in Colombia. Uh, Medellin and Colombia, we're actually running a series of sprints all around, uh, believe it or not, um, uh, modernizing the justice system and uh, the, lending, uh, the lending practices within Medellin. So we, we do work with, with the, I mean, I'm gonna broadly call it the uh, construction industry. So we do work with the construction industry, and this is what we are seeing. So we have a partner in the UK who's, you know, he's very actively talking to construction companies who are pretty sh shaken up in the UK right now about uh, um, Carillion. You know, I'm sure you've all heard of this, the largest construction company in the UK has just gone bankrupt. Uh, I think there's thir there are 30,000 suppliers who are, owe money, billions of dollars in debt, billions of dollars in uh, damage done. So the good and the bad, right? So there's, there's, these, there's this company, Carillion, but we're also talking to companies who are actively pursuing 3D printing of buildings using drones to replace what they traditionally would do with scaffolds, for example. And business information modeling seems to be something that we're seeing, which is really, really growing in scope. So what I want to do today is to try and put this into some useful frameworks for you. Um, you know, you're gonna leave here after spending a whole week with many people, a few drinks, uh, lots of coffee, lots of food. And if I, can just, if, you can, if I can just leave you with a couple of frameworks that'll help you think through your business, then I'll be, I'll be happy. So the first framework is we are in the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, so the first industrial revolution was all about mechanization, applying steam power, through to the second, through to the third industrial revolution, which is all about complying, applying automation and um, computer power. This industrial revolution is very different, very different. This, this, this revolution is a complete blurring of lines between physical, biological, and digital boundaries. If, it, if this all sounds a bit way out there, it is way out there, right? It really is way out there. There's things happening now which we've never seen before. 
And as a result, when we're working with our clients in the, in the construction business, in the financial services business, in the insurance business, we, we help them to understand that you don't really know what's going to happen in the future. You, you just really don't know. I mean, who, who thought, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago you could 3D print a multi-story building, right? So you, we, we just don't know what's going to happen. So who, who, who's making sense of all this? So one of the companies that I spent um, two years helping to build is Singularity University. They're based at the uh, NASA Ames Research Park in uh, Mountain View, California. And what they do is they have sponsors such as Google and NASA, and they seek to apply uh, exponential technologies to the world's greatest problems, right? So how do we use technology to solve poverty, natural disasters, food, food, excuse me, food shortage, cleanliness of water? And they were founded by a the two people. The first gentleman was, was, was Ray Kurzweil. He wrote a book, and this is obviously one of the frameworks I want to give you. So he wrote a book called The Singularity is, the Singularity is Near, which states that um, once machine learning, once machine learning or AI has reached a certain stage, it'll have the same amount of power, the same amount of oomph as all human intelligence combined. And once that, once that happens, you have the singularity. Okay, so that, just, just to give you a framework of how these guys think. They live off this curve, which is the law of accelerating returns. And they, they found that once you apply any, any domain, any, if there's anything you can apply information technology to, then, it, then its price performance doubles roughly every 18 months. Right? So think about uh, computing power. Computing power, the price performance doubles every 18 months. If you, if you go and buy new, new computers for your business today, you'll find they're twice as powerful as they were the last time you bought, bought a computer. So he found that, uh, Ray Kurzweil found that if you go back over 100 years into the 1800s, no matter what happens, World War I, World War II, the Great Recession, if you apply information technology to any domain, its price performance keeps doubling. It just keeps getting more and more powerful. And, now, and, and then if you, take that, if you take that computing power, Peter Diamandis, who's the other founder of Singularity, he wrote a book called Abundance, which, which he states, if you can apply all this technology to the world's greatest problems, you can eradicate most of them in the next 10, 10 to 15 years. So again, think about, uh, you know, think about drones flying over Haiti after the disaster. So let's, let's just double click a little bit um, on, this, um, on, this, on this doubling pattern, right? Because this doubling pattern is very important for you to understand in your businesses. So, the first, the first ever circuit board was, in, uh, was built in 1958. It had two transistors. Okay, so, you know, a chip transistor, it had two. By the 70s, there were 2,300. Now, now the circuit boards have over 21 billion transistors. Okay, so it's gone from two to 21 billion. And when I first built this slide three years ago, this is incredible, when I first built this slide, the, uh, the box on the right was seven billion. Right, so it's gone from 7 billion to 21 billion. Another example are sensors. This is the world's first inertial measurement unit, which is you know, um, a sensor that figures out you know, how you're tilted, how you're moving, how fast you're traveling. It, was, it weighed 50 pounds, it was about this big, and it was used for the big um, missiles, the intergalactic missiles. Sorry, intercontinental missiles, not intergalactic. Not yet. That's, that's, my, that's my next slide. <laughs> um, okay, so now, now you have the same technology, the same sensor, it does the same thing. You all have one in your pocket right now, smartphones, and that's pretty obvious. But also sensors are now tiny, tiny, tiny macro sensors. There are now sensors now that you can inject in your vein. It goes down to the tip of your finger where it lodges, and it sends a message to your smartphone um, if, you're, if you're at increased risk of heart disease. Okay, so this technology is getting more and more powerful every year. And we're seeing these doubling patterns across these technologies. Okay, so obviously the one most people are focused on right now is AI, but we're seeing it across all, all these technologies, including digital manufacturing, which I'm guessing is the closest to the people in this room. So Singularity University, this awesome company that I, I spent two years helping to build, what have they done that's actually useful? So they, they built a company called Matinet, 
which was founded to help people in Haiti after uh, the disaster there. This, comp this is a, it's a drone company. Uh, if, you, if you go online, you can see this. They're, they're now actually delivering blood supplies between hospitals in Switzerland. So there's a place called Lugano in Switzerland. If you have a blood test there, it's very likely a drone will take it to another hospital to be tested. They also, um, they're also, when I was a singularity, there was a, there was a company there called Scandu, and they've they're actually gone back into stealth mode now, but they have a device almost exactly this size. You hold it to the left side of your head, and it tracks seven different um, health, health features. You know, um, oxygen levels in blood, um, stress levels, heart rate, et cetera. So that, that is a technology which the idea is this, this can replace you having to go and visit doctors. Another technology that Singularity wasn't involved in, but, but just to show how quickly things are moving, is um, in Dubai, they're actually now testing drone taxis. Okay, so th this is new for this year. If you go to Dubai, you can't use this year. I, I, we were in um, Sao Paulo recently, and you can actually, it's easier to get a helicopter from the airport to your hotel there because the traffic's so bad. In Dubai, they're actually testing um, drone taxis. Okay, so all of this is cool stuff, it's interesting, but it's, but it's gonna be exponentially bigger, exponentially more powerful, because there's a lot of huge companies out there, such as uh, Alphabet, the parent of, of, of Google, which are spending millions of dollars bringing bandwidth to other parts of the world that don't have bandwidth. So has anyone heard of this project, Project Loon? other than Vanessa. <laughs> Vanessa's my colleague over there, she knows all this stuff. So Project Loon is run by X. So X is, it used to be Google X, X is Google's moonshot factory, okay? So very simply, actually, correction, it's not very simple at all. But at a high level, um, uh, Project Loon uses the stratosphere to fly hot air balloons around the world, right? So as you know, the uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, the kind of air either goes, the wind either goes this way or that way, right, depending on how, how high up you are, the jet streams, excuse me. So if you can raise or lower these balloons, you can make them go in different directions. And they use radio and laser signals to connect these balloons and then fire um, internet access down to the world below. If this sounds crazy, it's, it's a real thing. Let me show you. Run a small farm. When I'm using the internet, the first thing I'll check is the weather, see if my sheep are going to dry out. And at the moment, the wool's not dry. Um, so I'm just looking for a window so I can plan my week. We've gone through a number of different internet providers to try and get reliable internet. It was so slow that we had to click on a page and um, go and find something to do for 10 minutes. So, can you give us a quick update on the, on the launch? Having a team from Google on our farm to try all this for the first time. It's been, been really exciting. Yeah. All right, coming out three, two, one. Straight, straight up, up, straight up, straight up, straight up. Starting today, we're launching a few dozen balloons so that 50 testers right here in the Christchurch area can get online through this experimental balloon network. Bingo. Yay! And that was fast, too. <laughs> To be the first person to do that is it, it was a little bit cool as well. <laughs> Having access to the internet can change lives, and there are five billion people on the earth that aren't reached. Balloon powered internet sounds positively mad, and in a way it is, but it's mad in a very practical way that could just work. Okay, so that was that was that's the theory, right? That's the testing. So, so recently, uh, Hurricane Maria, as you know, devastated Puerto Rico. You know, I'm sure we all have friends who live in Puerto Rico or from Puerto Rico. What, but what's pretty obvious is almost everything was wiped out, right? So all, the, all of the telephone companies, all of their connectivity was wiped out, the electricity companies, but also internet access was wiped out. So what happened was the governor of uh, Puerto Rico actually reached out to X, which is a Google company, an alphabet company, and they asked for their help. So what happened was, within a few weeks, X was sending balloons from Nevada. I mean, this sounds completely crazy, right? If you hadn't just seen the video, you probably think I was making this up. They sent balloons from Nevada to fly in the, in the stratosphere over Puerto Rico. And within weeks, they had over 100,000 people reconnected to the internet. 
And now, now there's over 200,000 people using this loon, this, this weather balloon system. So again, another framework I'm trying to give you is to think big. There's some really big, crazy things happening out there, and price performance is doubling every year. So therefore, you need to think differently. So the way, the way I put this is, the way I like to describe this is, our brains are wired in such a way. We're designed in, you know, we come from a very linear way of thinking, which is, you know, there's a, I mean, one, of, one of the favorite ways I've heard to describe this is there's a, there's a lion running towards me or a tiger. I just need to figure out, can I run faster than this gentleman, right? If I can run faster than you, you're in, you're in trouble, I'm safe, right? Or how far can I walk in a day? How far is it to get, um, you know, get to a water source? But that's all changed, right? It's all changed now. Now we're flying balloons over Puerto Rico to fire down internet access. Now we're using drones as taxi transportation. Now we're using virtual reality, augmented reality. The problem is we, ca we can't figure it out. Our brains are not designed to think that way. We just can't think, we just can't fathom how it's possible to do these things. And from a business, well, from a business perspective, for you all in the room, that's your risk. That's your risk. And that's what we as a company, EXO Works, do. You know, when, when, we're, when we're working with the CEO of TD Ameritrade or the CEO of Stanley Black & Decker, that's what we're helping them with is you, you and your executive team can't think the way that you need to think. Okay, and if, and if you don't think that way, here's what's gonna happen, right? So you're, you're thinking along the, along the blue line here, which is a linear way of thinking. Yeah, things are gonna continue to progress the way they always have. Meanwhile, technology, which is the red curve, is just doubling, 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 and you get left behind. So this is the risk. So you are gonna be disrupted. Okay. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, it just means you have to adapt. And some would argue we already have been disrupted. So another framework for you to think through is the six phases of disruption. Okay. So what, what should I be looking out for in my business, whether it's scaffold business or providing services to the scaffold business, such as insurance companies or software companies? So this, this theory has been proven very well, actually, which is once something becomes digitized, it goes onto this road and it goes through these six phases of disruption and it does not stop. So it goes from digitized all the way through to democratized. So let's look at these. So the first one's obvious. If you can digitize something, it gets on this journey. So the obvious example is maps, right? But we could probably name 100 examples in here. Next example, and this is the really dangerous phase. Super, super dangerous. It goes through a deceptive phase. Digital, com digital cameras is one example. We all know the Kodak example. Kodak invented the uh, digital camera in the 70s, then they locked it away in a room, then they went bankrupt. Another example I like to talk about is Google Glass, right? So Google Glasses, does anyone in this room own Google Glasses? No, right? And no one's wearing them because you'd look like a real dummy if you were wearing Google Glasses in this room today. But the technology's there. The technology is there, it's in this disappointment phase. It's kind of bubbling along, the technology is there, it's doubling in price performance every year. And before we know it, all of your safety supervisors on a construction site are gonna be wearing a contact lens, being fed information, it's there. It's there, so it's going through a deceptive phase. Then it gets to a very disruptive phase. And, you know, the obvious example is blockbusters. Then it goes through this phase. Materialized, right? So things, so things cease to exist. And the actual, the really interesting thing about that video is, that video ends in 2018, so only four years ago. That's out of date, right? Because it's no longer the computer; it's now an app, right? So things become dematerialized, demonetized. 
The next phrase, it becomes free. How the heck, how the heck do you compete with free? So the best example I, I like here is uh, Skype. I, I moved to America. I used to live in Hong Kong. I moved to America from Hong Kong about 22 years ago. He used to call me a dollar a minute to call my mum. Right? Now it's free. Right? So it goes to the next phase where things are free. How, how do you compete with that? And then my favorite phase is democratized. And this is, this is pretty simple in concept, which is there used to be a certain amount of power that only governments or kings and queens had. There's only so much influence you can have if, unless you're a king or queen. But now companies have as much power, they can do as many things as, as, com as countries used to. So think of Facebook. Think of how, much, how many people touch Facebook every day. But also, as importantly, people, so this guy in skinny jeans here, this teenager, he has as much power now as companies. He can disrupt you. He can build an app. He can build a business pretty easily in his, in his garage, which, which can disrupt you. So that, that's, that's the final phase of disruption. So let, let's get on to your business now, right? So let's start sort of bring this into the, uh, you know, in broad terms, the construction business. I realize most people here are in the scaffold industry, but if we, if we have this broad in the construction business. So the big question to ask yourselves is, are you a linear organization? Are you still doing things in a very linear fashion? Although I think these shirts are back in fashion now. I have one. I need to change this slide. The haircuts are not back in fashion. So are you a linear organization living in an exponential world? Are you doing things in your company, you know, pen and paper, stick it notes? Uh, are, you, are you slow to adapt? Are you refusing to or, or, or just not focused on technology? Are you doing things in a very linear way? when the world is just changing incredibly rapidly. So we, we ask these questions, um, you know, a lot of CEO, CEOs of very large companies come to Silicon Valley. I'm actually based in New York, but we spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley. And basically, we, we find that when CEOs of very large companies go to Silicon Valley and they meet the companies we introduce them to, 100% of, of the CEOs say they expect there to be game-changing disruption in their business within five years. Before they go, not so much. When they come back, absolutely. So that's, that's a pretty sobering thought, right? If, 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 if you're thinking, yeah, you know, the business we're in is safe from disruption, there's not gonna be any big game-changing disruption, maybe, maybe, maybe think again, right? Maybe think again. Um, we, we do a lot of work. We have a partnership with Accenture. Um, Accenture says that about half the companies which have disappeared have disappeared because of digitization. Other companies have come in and disrupted them. And then David Rose states that if you're a company designed for success in the 20th century, it ain't gonna work in the 21st century, okay? So, you know, we have balloons flying over our head to Puerto Rico now, beaming down internet access. We need to think differently. And if that doesn't make you think differently, perhaps this will. So usually, Vanessa's not allowed to answer this, <laughs> usually, at least one person in the room, room knows what this is. Does anyone, does anyone know what this is? Usually one person. Okay, so this is Amazon. This is a beehive skyscraper. So Amazon last year filed a patent for this. It's a, a, the, the idea is it's a skyscraper that they're gonna build in the middle of cities, such as Chicago, and trucks are gonna go in the bottom, they're gonna, deliver, they're gonna you know, load up with packages in a warehouse, and then drones are gonna deliver. The more you think about it, the less crazy it gets, actually. And then drones are going to deliver packages from rooftop to rooftop, right? So they'll fly out of, they'll fly out of this beehive and they'll deliver packages to the top of this hotel. So whatever you're thinking in terms of how you're gonna innovate or change, other people are thinking differently and, and bigger. And um, one of these quotes that I like, and this, this is a quote about construction, but candidly, this could be about any, any industry, is very likely that disruption is gonna come from outside your industry. I mean, you're, you, you're a very traditional business. You're all about pipes. How many pipes do you have in your yard? You know, are they rented out? Are they not? You know, how many jobs do you have going at the moment? But indus, uh, disruption typically comes from outside your industry. So that, that's something for you to look at. One of my, and just to give you sort of an idea to help you wrap your minds around this, so my, my friend David Roberts talks about spice and ice. Okay, he, he has a big spice and ice talk. So the whole concept here is the spice industry, which I'm a, I'm a real history buff. You know, I, love, I love the whole stories about people going to places like the Philippines and they'd get a, 
a bag of cloves, then they can retire for life, right? Because a bag of cloves is so expensive. Spices were just to stop rot rotten food tasting bad. That's all it was for. Food, food rotted and spices made it palatable. It was an unbelievable business. You could retire after one trip. That business was completely killed. Completely killed. Sorry, not completely. The scale of the business was completely disrupted by people figuring out how to harvest ice. So you harvest ice, keep food fresh. You don't have to put spices in it, you just keep it fresh. That business was completely disrupted by ice boxes. Okay, and then ice boxes were disrupted by refrigerators. So in every case, spice industry disrupted by guys bringing out ice, ice industry disrupted by people making refrigerators. In my opinion, the next step is gonna be genetic engineering. Okay, so we already have, I mean, I'm, I'm 48 years old. For 48 years, I've been drinking UHT milk, right? Milk which doesn't go off. You can just keep it in your, uh, keep it in your cupboard. So I, I think that, if I was in the refrigerator business, I'd be looking at things like genetic engineering, so food actually doesn't go off as quickly. I'd be looking at things like Amazon, which, which can deliver food every day. So anyway, the point I'm making is, if you're looking at disruption, um, don't, don't just look at the company on your left and right. Look at what's happening outside your industry for disruption. Um, and then the reason, this is a bit of a down of the slide, so I'll move on it quickly, but the reason, um, the reason I think the construction industry can, can be disrupted is there's friction, right? So whenever there's friction, there's, there's, it's right for disruption. So I actually have a friend who owns, he, he owns a company, um, a large construction company called Hollister in um, New Jersey. He's pretty stressed out most of the time. It's a pretty stressful job. So where there's friction, there's room for innovation. So think of Uber, obvious example. You used to completely suck getting taxis, you'd have to wave one down. If it was raining, you'd have to get your credit card or your cash out. Now it's completely, the friction's removed from that business using Uber. Um, so, specific to your industry, companies that we're talking to, people that we, you know, people that we sort of interface with in your industry, we're seeing a few different things going on. I'm, I'm just gonna give you a very high level, and I'm sure a lot of you are seeing the same things. So the first we're seeing is drones. So drones can do a lot. They can do it very well, very quickly. Um, are there any uh, um, insurance people in the room today? No insurance people? Okay, so uh, drone, drones have been used by a lot of insurance companies. Um, so here's an example. So travelers are, are, are in the process of training hundreds and hundreds of drone pilots. So when there's... Uh, you know, if somebody has a problem with their roof, you, you just throw a drone up there, it looks at the roof. But bigger than that, I've, to, I've talked to chief, chief innovation officers of large insurance companies who are, uh, you know, such as AXA, who are focused on, if there's a natural disaster, so, you know, if St. Louis or Missouri has a, a huge, uh, you know, hurricane goes through there and devastates, you know, devastates dozens of houses, they can now fly drones over the top and use AI to recognize which buildings they've insured and then automatically send out payment. So drones are doing a lot, a lot of things that the scaffold business is currently doing. And then Betterview, which is a, a drone company, has actually completed more, more than 6,000 roof inspections. Um, two years ago, the world's first um, uh, commercial boiler inspection was carried out by a, by a drone, so instead of scaffolding, they just sent a drone in there, and it did, it did the same job. This was in 2016. Um, and then another, so that's drones. Another technology we're seeing a lot of is, is 3D printing. And Vanessa, my friend over there, has talked to, I think you've talked to your father about this, right? He's in the business. So 3D printing is one of those things which, to me, sounds really crazy. <laughs> like, if I think of it from a very high level, it just sounds, the whole concept of 3D printing in buildings sounds crazy, right? But here's why it's, why it's not. So this is a business called Made in Space, which my friends at Singularity University actually, because they're based at NASA, they connected a startup called Made in Space, which is a 3D printing company with NASA. And the problem with NASA, the problem with space is, there isn't much space in spaceships, in space stations. So you can't take a lot of spare tools up there. So what happened was, now on the International Space Station, whenever a tool breaks, the astronaut just emails down, hey, mission control, this tool's broken. And they, they email up the uh, designs for a new tool. 
And while the astronaut's sleeping, they 3D print a replacement. So this is the first, what you're looking at here is the first, sorry, I, up here, is the first man-made object not made on Earth. Right, so it was man-made, but it wasn't made in Earth. So 3D printing's a thing. Um, if we stay with the space, the space uh, area, Orion, which is, which is the spaceship that's gonna go out to Mars and everything, uh, they're actually, they're, they're gonna print 100 different parts using 3D printing. And then in your industry, 3D printing of buildings is here. And I'm, I'm sure most of you in the room have heard about this, but in, uh, in El Salvador, a company called Icon is actually 3D printing houses. If you haven't seen it, here's what it looks like. Uh, these houses are currently 1,000 square feet because technology changes every year, it doubles, doubles, doubles. They think they can build a 2,000 square foot house in a, in a, in a day in the very near, near future. The army, these are, um, these are, these are barrack blocks. So the, uh, the US Army has filed this patent. This patent is about the material they use. So the army is actually uh, involved in, in uh, 3D printing barrack buildings now. So again, this is all real, it's all here. And then the interesting thing to me as it relates to, to the scaffold business is it's actually going vertical, right? So it's gone from one, one story to multi-story. So there's a company called Contour Crafting which is actually it can actually build multi-story buildings now. And then there was a story in China recently, this is from The Guardian, an English newspaper, that, now this is not 3D printing, but it just shows you where this can go. It took 19 days to build a 57-story building. So again, I'm not in the scaffold business, but I'd imagine it takes more than 19 days to build scaffolding for a 57-floor building. These guys had finished the damn building before there's any scaffolding needed, right? So this stuff's... This stuff's happening. This stuff's happening really, really quickly. Okay, another, another key, area, key area that we're seeing is business information modeling. So business in, is anyone here involved in business information modeling? Okay, wow, okay. Oh yeah, there's some hands over there. Okay, how are you guys? Talk to these guys over there. Uh, so business information modeling is, uh, sorry, information modeling, excuse me. The whole concept is, um, if you go to the very bottom bullet here, is lots of industries we're seeing, including the construction industry, are moving away from a services industry, sorry, moving away from a product industry to a services industry. So what you do is very product-based, right? You, are, you build things, you provide scaffolding. But what we're seeing a lot of in, in the construction business is a move to provide more services around that, right? So the services around uh, bringing in from, from the very beginning planning phase to the actual operating the building. Uh, it's estimated this is going to be a $14 billion industry, and we're seeing a lot of this going on. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the benefits for you as service providers are pretty obvious around longevity, disruption proof, longer, you know, longer revenue cycles. In England, um, in England there's actually an organization which is actually put together the first international standards around, around BIM. So this is actually happening, right? So the first standards are around the frameworks, but then by, by 2020, there'll actually be international standards around how to operate a building using BIM. Um, are the Av Avantis guys in the room? There you go, oh, I thought so, how are you guys? So Avantis is actually using, uh, using BIM as a way to provide services to their clients. So within BIM, there's actually um, many things you can do. One, one of them is using virtual reality. So I, I'm gonna show you a video shortly around, uh, around virtual reality. So virtual reality has been used by Avantis and by other companies to reduce the amount of time it takes to show your customer what a scaffold looks like. So if you build a scaffold, what's it gonna look like? And then the person who needs to erect the scaffolding or, or the builder who needs to use it can actually use the VR to go in and look and really understand it. And the idea is it's 50% quicker, less errors. So here's a, here's a video that shows how this works. Volvo is really a human-centric company. That's the core focus of everything we've done in terms of the products we develop, but also the way we interact with their customers. The HoloLens is a device that you put on your head and it doesn't intrude in any of the things you do, but it also extends the realities around you. You can do something you could never do before. You can see the soul of the car. You can strip the body out and stay with the skeleton. And you, you can play around with it. 
The HoloLens can allow our customers to see features, colors, options. So rather than working on the computer, seeing things, you can be part of the experience. No one understands how car sensors actually work today. Through the HoloLens, you can see how the car perceives you. And then you, know, you give me as a human being the vantage point of a sensor. It helps to build a much better trust in this type of systems. For example, you see a car coming in front of you. The car has features that could aid in that situation. We have a lot of features that we don't necessarily want you to experience it all, but it's part of our proposition. You're buying into the safest car brand in the world. HoloLens will not only help us in the car buying process at the dealership, it can evolve into many areas. We think there are many alternative applications of this tool in the future, and Volvo clearly has an aspiration to, to break out of the pack. It's, um, it's cool. It's, it's way cool. I want to I have a beer with that guy. This guy, cool guy. Okay, so, so Microsoft HoloLens is being used, so vir virtual reality is being used in your business. Appreciate this is the car manufacturing business. That's a business that we've worked with a lot in the past, but it, it is being used. Other, other macro trends, um, modular housing has been described as the biggest disruption in 100 years. Um, there, are, there are now chemical companies that we're seeing who are designing paints and other, other, other treatments that never or very rarely need to be repaired. And then there's a, there's a lot of uh, activity with these very large companies self-servicing, self building their own, you know, using their own scaffolding. Okay, so, so we're seeing a lot of change in the business. This is from an um, innovation disruption perspective. This is what we're seeing in your business. Okay, and I would argue that your business is, is sort of here, right? So if we go back to this curve, we have the disruptive phase. Well, you know, there's not much happening. But bubbling along in here, you have virtual reality, 3D printing, chemicals that never need to be fixed and replaced. This is all, this is all bubbling along. Okay, so I can't, I can't give a talk like this without discussing the social impact because you know, we're not, we, don't, we don't live in a silo. So there's something called pace layering, which really focuses on in every, in every civilization, there are different layers that move at different speeds. And these, these, this, this difference in speeds causes friction. So the outside speed, the fastest layer, is technology. Technology changes every, every year and a half. It doubles in price performance. And you can actually change business models pretty quickly as well, right? You know, I think particularly the smaller, the smaller the company are, the quicker you can change business models. But the problem is everything else moves really, really slowly. So culture, governance, and nature change very, very slowly. So some examples of how this causes friction is, so we used to work a singularity, we used to work with the CEO of Taser, which is now called Axon. Um, he has a new business model, the CEO has a new business model, which is give every police officer in the US a free body camera, which is great, and I 100% and I, I support the police, there's a lot of police and firemen in my wife's family. The problem is the, um, the rules and regulations around this haven't yet been locked in at a federal level. Right, so if you're a police officer, do you have to have your camera on? You know, what, what are the regulations around? Do you, can you switch it off? Does it have to have sound? So that's an example of how the technology's there, the business model's there, the governance, it, governance isn't, isn't quite there yet. Another example is uh, um, internet businesses. So my wife works for Amazon. She's been there for six years now. Until recently, she wasn't allowed to fly into, mini, into Minnesota. If she flew into Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota state could say, hey, Amazon, you're conducting business in Minnesota, you owe us tax, right? So the whole rules and regulations around selling things online hasn't yet been resolved. She can fly to Minnesota now, it's been resolved. But there are still, there's still a lot of this going on. You're selling businesses, you're selling products online into my state or my country, you owe me tax. Uh, the FDA, there's all kinds of medical devices which haven't been approved yet. And then this is my favorite one, this is a driverless car in California. Doesn't even have a steering wheel, but it has a rear view mirror. Any, any ideas why this has a, rear, has a wing mirror, a rear view mirror? Because the state of California says cars have to have rear view mirrors. Right? So this car doesn't even have a steering wheel, but it has a rear view mirror. 
technology, business model, governance. So I'm going to show you um, a video now. There's a couple of swear words. I, I think you're all pretty uh, thick-skinned in this room. Let's have a look at this. Against team will never believe this. Oh my goodness. Go is the right word. Holy shit. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Oh my god. What? It's driving itself. Ah! Ah! My wife can drive like that, I can't. Um, so that, that is, at EXO Works, we say that's a scream of humanity trying to adapt to technology. And in, interestingly enough, engineers have figured out the way to make this less scary for people is to remove the steering wheel, right? It's a, it's a mental thing. Okay, finally, let's, let's, let's bring this home then. So how, how do you as business owners adapt to this, right? So if you believe that technology is doubling a price performance every year, if you believe as disruption is coming, <clears throat> if you believe that you can be disruptive from outside the industry, um, how, do you, how do you start to think about this? Now, the key thing I want to say is when we work with our clients, we say, actually, don't change what you're doing wholesale right now. What you're doing is wildly successful. If it wasn't, you wouldn't all be sitting in this room, right? But you do need to start thinking about other, other options on the edge, other different things, in case your core business does start to erode. So myself and Vanessa, we're not standing here saying you need to completely discard everything. We're just saying start thinking about other things on the edge as disruption starts to creep into your business. So here's, here's, I'm, going to, I'm going to take you to two frameworks. So framework number one is called the Three Horizon Framework. So the Three Horizon Framework very simply says, you as business owners need to start managing your business along three time horizons. It's no longer good enough to manage your business just on this quarter, this year. You need to think about horizon one, which is delivery today. So what, what, what projects do we have going on today? How do you manage those? Horizon two, which is about six to 12 months out, sorry, six to 18 months out. What's happening next? What's, what's version 2.0 of what we're doing? How do we make what we do leaner, more efficient, and better? But then the third horizon in every industry, including the construction industry, is what are the huge industry game changers out there? So three to five years out, are we focused on something that's going to completely change the industry? And the secret is you have to manage all of these three horizons at the same time. It's no longer good enough just to manage now. You have to be thinking what's happening five years out. And Vanessa, my friend Vanessa over here, I think you've been talking to your family business about 3D printing, right? I'm sure initially your father thought you were crazy, but now he's actually using it, right? So you, as, as business owners, you need to start thinking along these three horizons. The second and final framework is exponential organizations, and this is the company that, that, that I run. So Salim Ismail, in 2000, 2014, noted that there were a, a set of companies out there that, that behaved differently. They did things differently, and as a result, they were having 10x performance. So they were having you know, 10 times more output, 10 times more revenue per employee, 10 times more clients, uh, a tenth of the cost, and so he looked into how, how they're doing things differently. So one of them was, was Tangerine, which was a bank created up in California, uh, excuse me, up in Canada by ING. And they really focused on employee autonomy, right? They wanted people to be totally autonomous. So the CEO uh, said, look, you can vote me in every year. If you don't want me anymore, you can vote me out every year. No job descriptions, no formal roles. I mean, this wouldn't fly in construction, right? It's too, there's, there's too much physical danger. But how do we, uh, and as a result, they, they, they had seven times more customers per employee, and they actually have about 10 times, more, 10 times more revenue per customer. Another example is Amazon. As I mentioned, my wife works for Amazon. They have something called institutional yes, which is if you go into your boss's office and say, I have a new business idea, your boss has to say yes, right? or write a two-page memo saying why the answer is no. Right, so the institutional, yes. Yeah. So there, Amazon is very focused on experimentation. How do you experiment with new business models? And these companies, the, these companies who are found to be these exponential companies, two years ago on the NASDAQ, on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange, five of them here, so Gilead isn't one of them, but five of them represented almost 
50% of the growth on the NASDAQ stock exchange. So these companies do things differently, and they're wildly successful. They, rec they, they represent about half the growth on the, on the uh, stock exchange. Also, so we, we took these companies, this is a bit of a busy slide, but we took these companies and we ranked them by how exponential they were. We work with a business school. We ranked, we ranked them by how exponential they were, how lean, how flexible they were, and then we measured their stock performance. And we found the companies that are the most dynamic and flexible have the best stock performance. You know, the companies that are the most exponential have, have the best stock performance. The ones that are the least exponential and dynamic and lean and flexible have the worst stock performance. So there's something there, and this is why we're getting phone calls from all over the world from CEOs of very large companies saying, you need to come and spend time with us. So what do these companies do differently? The first is they have a massive transformative purpose. They have a purpose, it's like a, a mission statement, but it's huge and it's world changing. So they have a purpose which everyone can rally around. The employees can rally around, the clients can rally around. Unilever is, is, a, is one of the first companies that we work with. Their massive transformative purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace. Our massive tran transformative purpose is the global transformation of business. So they have a big, bold purpose which everyone can rally around. The second thing they do, again, it's another busy slide, but I, I make sure you'll, you'll have copies of this, is there are 10 attributes they, they, they follow. So, Ten, sorry, five are very focused on the outside, five are focused on keeping them super lean and efficient. And the work that we do at EXO Works is to help companies adopt these attributes. And we found that if you adopt about four to five of these attributes, you tend to start behaving like an exponential company. So a quick example is, um, so on the outside of the business, staff on demand. These large companies often use more staff on demand than they do employees keeps your cost low, keep, keeps you lean. Uh, they also use leverage assets, right? So um, they would use you, right? They would use your, your scaffold poles rather than their own, right? So they use leverage assets rather than buying their own, uh, you know, buying their own um, materials. But also on the inside, then they bring all that abundance inside the company and, they, and they're very focused on things like experimentation, using dashboards and using interfaces to be able to quickly analyze what's going on, on in the industry to adapt to what's going on inside. So this is, this is my sort of final, final few slides here. So I'm going to take a bit of a pause here. So you just heard me talk for a while about you know, balloons flying around the world and exponential technologies and, and the US Army building barrack, barrack buildings out of uh, 3D printers. So how, how can you start to bring this back to your company? Right, so what I would say is that there's two ways you can do this, and you can do this yourself, right? And perhaps you are doing this yourself. So you, you currently have, and let me, let me sort of step back here. So your current organization is on the left. The idea is to move to a model on the right where you're not changing your current organization. You're not, sorry, you're not drastically changing it. What you're doing is you're looking at what technologies and business models are there that can make you more, uh, more lean and efficient on the inside. And you know, the example I think of is using some super obvious things like using um, uh, accounting software instead of pen and paper. I mean, that's just a crazy obvious example. So you make, your, you make your internal business as efficient as possible. And we, we've worked with very large companies to help them do this, the very small companies. But here's the key thing. It's time to start balancing, you know, balancing some of that with some experiments on the edge. It's time to start doing that because the world's changing so quickly. So you may say, I mean, the, the example I've been using today is drones, right? So perhaps it's time to start saying, well, we need to hedge. I mean, this is a really basic example, but we need to hedge against um, people using drones for inspections more than scaffolding, for example, right? So what you do is you just start experimenting on the edge. Perhaps you buy one drone. And you can buy a really good industrial drone now for less than $1,000, and maybe you're already doing this. But you start experimenting. And what a lot of companies do is they have a few experiments going on. And you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to try something. Ah, it doesn't work. The client didn't need that. But as long as you're trying to solve a real client problem, and as long, bless you, and as long as it's in a world where, as long as it's in an area where you have a right to compete in, like don't go and start making shoes, right, or cars. But if it's in the construction industry and you, and you know that business, you feel like you have a right to compete, I would suggest it's time to start experimenting. 
Because what will often happen, and I, I have an example of this, is this. Right? So you start experimenting. Then your core, if your core business shrinks, it's OK. You're covered. An example I use is there's a company called Widen. It's a digital asset management company we're working with in Madison, Wisconsin. Their example here was so their scaffold business was printing, and their drone business was digital asset management. So uh, you know, helping companies store things like photographs. So now, if you go to their office now in Madison, they look like this. So they've actually taken this experiment, and it's taken over their, their, their core business. OK, so parting thoughts. So my, my argument, to you, my recommendation to you, and this is my recommendation to all industries, is solving today's problems and iterating you know, current business may, may not be enough. It may not be enough just to say, hey, we do what we do. We're just going to keep iterating. We're going to keep getting a little bit better, a little bit better. That's not in, it's, it may not be enough. Um, Across all industries, we tell people that you are not safe from disruption from outside their business. So don't think, well, you know, we've got, we've got the scaffold business down. We know how to find clients. We know how to service them. We have an amazing uh, safety record. Um, that, that doesn't mean you're not safe from disruption outside the business. So you need to start looking there. And finally, you, you, you may need to fundamentally shift your whole business model. Maybe, maybe. OK, so I wish, I wish you all luck. I hope I've given you some, uh, I hope I've given you some um, insight and some thoughts for the rest of this, you know, the rest of your time here. Um, I'm happy to take questions, whatever the organizers think. But uh, that's it for me. Th thank you very much.